Good morning, everybody. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the New South and the New West, which is the topic that we're going to be uh, focusing on this week. And this week there are really kind of three big questions that we'll be looking at. Uh, we're going to be looking at why the New South largely failed to materialize in the late 19th century. We are going to examine how the environment of the West affected the way it was settled. And we're going to look at how the reality of Western expansion is different or it, how it differs from the mythology that has grown up around the Old West. So to start us off, let's explore this topic of the New South and how the South develops in the period following Reconstruction right up through about the year 1900 or so. So after the end of Reconstruction, most white Northerners and Southerners were only too happy to put the Civil War behind them. There's this general feeling throughout the country that it's time to let bygones be bygones and to get back to the business of running a country and creating a modern nation. And eventually people, or at least white Americans, uh, begin to look back on the Civil War almost fondly, and they begin to romanticize the conflict to a great extent. Uh, and this sentiment is reflected in the way that we as a nation choose to commemorate the Civil War, uh, for a long time at least. This is a picture of an unidentified Confederate and Union soldier at the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. It's a reunion. Um, and this picture, I think, says a lot about the mindset of the country 50 years or so after such a bitter conflict. Now, these two sides have come together. They are letting bygones be bygones. They're shaking hands. They're embracing each other. Uh, and they are, you know, sort of trying to, you know, sort of put the past behind them. Reunion, of course, was tacitly, it was accomplished uh, by the North tacitly acquiescing in Southern discrimination. The dream of racial equality that the Civil War and Reconstruction had attempted to bring to reality was abandoned uh, after the end of Reconstruction. And the Civil War came to be remembered for a very long time as the war of brother against brother. Uh, it was not so much a war to end slavery and restore the ideas of freedom and equality, but it was more this sort of tragic family quarrel. Uh, and African Americans for a very long time were essentially written out of the story. Uh, and this is a great example of how history is how the present chooses to remember the past. By the late 19th century, Americans were choosing to remember the past of the Civil War and Reconstruction very differently from the way many of us choose to remember these events today. White Southerners, especially the elite classes, uh, they came to view the antebellum South and the Civil War almost with nostalgia. Uh, they had been defeated, of course. Uh, there was no getting around that. Uh, but fearing that they might lose their culture and lose their identity, white Southerners after Reconstruction reassert that identity with a vengeance. And they create this myth of the so-called lost cause. Uh, and it was almost a religion for some people, uh, this attempt to kind of revive a mythical pre-Civil War Golden Age South. It's a land of, it's portrayed as a land of chivalry where handsome gentlemen and lovely ladies court each other under the magnolia trees, where happy slaves toil away in the field singing their simple work songs. It's the South of Gone with the Wind, uh, which is, you know, sort of, first the book and later the movie. And with, this is real, probably the most famous example of antebellum nostalgia in American popular culture. So proponents of the lost cause, they portrayed the Confederacy's cause as noble, and they portrayed most of its leaders as really examples of old-fashioned chivalry. They were defeated 
according to this sort of retelling, uh, by the Union armies through overwhelming force rather than by martial skill. So the Confederates were no less good soldiers than the Union army was. In fact, they were probably portrayed uh, by many people as being even better, but they were just overwhelmed by the sheer power of the Union. Uh, proponents of the Lost Cause movement uh, also condemned even the only partial reconstruction that follows the Civil War. Uh, they argue that it, this was a deliberate attempt by northern politicians and speculators to destroy the southern way of life. And incidentally, this is when we start to see some of those Confederate monuments uh, erected that you can find almost everywhere in the country, but especially throughout the South. So the Southerners sort of choose to view the Civil War in this way. Um, and if we think about, well, if history really is how the present chooses to remember the past, Southerners in the late 19th century are choosing to remember a very different picture uh, of their history than most people today would see it. Uh, the lost cause kind of helps them try to cope with the psychological aspects of their defeat uh, but it also involves sort of a huge, you know, sort of papering over of the real history of slavery and uh, discrimination and, you know, violence that, uh, that characterized antebellum Southern society. Now, as you read in your textbook, uh, while many Southerners clung to this idea of the lost cause, some attempted to look to the future and to the creation of a new South. And the main champion of this guy was a guy named of this idea was a guy named Henry Grady, um, whom you can see here. He was the editor of the Atlanta Constitution newspaper. And he really did his best in the 1880s to promote the idea that the South was a region that was poised for an era of prosperity based on industrial expansion and agricultural diversification. He talked about the New South as being a, quote, perfect democracy, which indeed it was for the planters and merchants and industrialists who were prospering uh, and who not incidentally held the reins of power in the state governments in the South. Uh, some industry did develop, uh, but since the main attraction for investment were the fact that the South had very low wages, uh, its taxes were very low, and uh, there was a lot of cheap or even totally free labor, uh, as we're gonna see in just a minute, these industries didn't end up actually making much of a contribution to regional economic development, uh, with the exception of Birmingham, Alabama, which becomes an iron and steel manufacturing center. Most of the southern cities are export centers for agricultural products, uh, cotton, tobacco, rice. These are the same products that have been grown before the war, um, and there's not a lot of industry or skilled labor. And overall, the region really remained dependent on the North for capital and manufactured goods. So the New South really doesn't end up materializing. And we're going to explore kind of, you know, why that is the case. Part of it has to do with the fact that who is, you know, leading the New South at this point. There's this coalition of merchants and planters and business entrepreneurs who dominate Southern politics after 1877. And they call themselves Redeemers. Uh, and they attempted to undo as much as possible of Reconstruction. Uh, so they do things like they dismantled the public education system that had been tentatively put in place after the Civil War. Uh, Louisiana, for example, spent so little on public education that it became the only state in the Union in which the percentage of whites unable to read actually increases between 1880 and 1900. And of course, it was black schools that suffered the most. Uh, there's this gap in spending between black and white students, and it starts to widen steadily as the years go on. Uh, Southern states during this era pass a whole host of new laws authorizing the arrest of virtually anyone who was unemployed. Uh, and they greatly increase the penalties for petty crimes. So we start to see the prison population in the South begin to rise. And one of the sort of ways that they attempted to, you know, sort of utilize this new prison population was in renting out 
convicts. It became a really profitable business during this era. Uh, railroads and mines and lumber companies competed for this new kind of involuntary labor. And essentially, this is slavery under another name. It's no longer that you can actually enslave people, but if you're able to convict them of some crime, whether or not they actually committed any crime or not, if they are unemployed, if they're loitering around somewhere and they're picked up by the police, then they can be put in jail, they can be put in prison, uh, and they can be basically, you know, sort of made to work for private companies. Uh, and these convict labor camps were really terrible places. Uh, they were full of disease. The death rates were really staggering. For those who didn't fall victim to incarceration, there were other new forms of servitude that resemble the days under slavery. Uh, so even though, remember, we talked about uh, a couple of weeks ago, although black farmers in the South, they're initially encouraged by the federal government to settle and to farm the lands that they had always worked as slaves, Ultimately, this promise of getting 40 acres and a mule uh, was taken away. And so as a result, when the white owners retake possession of the land, they still need someone to help farm it. And black farmers needed some place to work. Slavery was no more, but the question was what system of labor would take its place. And the system that eventually comes to dominate southern labor was sharecropping. This was developed as sort of a compromise between white landholders, mostly former plantation owners, and the freedmen who wanted to own their own land. So how is sharecropping supposed to work? Uh, well, essentially in this system, the white landowners would hold the title to the land, but the land would be then subdivided into smaller plots to be worked by families, uh, initially mostly black families who were paid with a share of the crop hence the term sharecropping. And this was supposed to offer a certain degree of autonomy for the freedmen. Well, so this is how it's supposed to work. How does it actually work in practice? Essentially, uh, because the planters are the redeemers, they're the ones who are in charge of government, they're, they're allies, uh, the planters and their allies in government could create laws that protected their interests and exploited the sharecroppers. And this is also known, sharecropping is also known as the crop lien system. Um, and this, these crop liens work to put the sharecroppers into a cycle of almost perpetual debt. There's very little chance to get enough money to get outside the system. So the sharecropper, in order to use the plantation owner's land uh, and farming tools and animals, the sharecropper has to pay the plantation owner a certain amount of money uh, every year. And then, theoretically, they would be able to pay their, uh, their landlord back at the end of the year with their share of the crop, but in reality, it, that ends up not actually, you know, sort of usually occurring uh, because the prices on things like cotton and, uh, and other agricultural products in the South fell uh, to very low levels during this era. Uh, the, they were never able to kind of break out of this cycle of debt, so they just kept accumulating more and more debt, and they were locked in. Uh, and the system of sharecropping is often, has often seemed to be exploitative, which it definitely was. Uh, the daily lives of the freedmen who were sharecroppers were probably not all that much different than their daily lives under slavery. Uh, they were still, they might be still living on the same land. They would be farming in the same way. They would be harvesting crops and, you know, working the fields in the same way that they had under slavery. Uh, they might even be living in the same, you know, sort of uh, slave uh, quarters that they had lived in before, or something very similar. Um, however, there are important differences between sharecropping and slavery. Uh, and so these differences were, were are definitely important to note. The relationship between sharecroppers and their landlords was a decidedly capitalistic relationship. The planters were not their masters, uh, and so they had to find other ways to motivate their workers. They could not, at least theoretically, could not use the same kind of violent retribution or violent threat of punishment that they had when slavery existed. And sharecroppers had some control over their own lives. Uh, now they owned their own labor. 
And to own one's own labor, it means that if things get really, really bad and you are being treated unfairly, you can theoretically choose not to work or to, you know, sort of practice other forms of resistance. So you can, you know, sort of even maybe choose to, to leave if you want to, um, if you have the means. By the late, and the other sort of thing that makes sharecropping distinctive from slavery is that by the late 1870s and early 1880s, many poorer whites are joining the ranks of sharecroppers. So this is not necessarily a racially based system of labor like slavery was. Uh, despite these differences, sharecropping was a horribly unfair system, uh, and it serves to lock many of the freedmen into a perpetual cycle of debt and economic dependence. Now, as this is sort of, you know, being developed during and after Reconstruction, uh, from about 1876 through the 1900s, southern states also begin to impose a series of restrictions on black civil rights known as the Jim Crow laws. Uh, and they took their name from this character, Jim Crow, uh, who was a very popular character in minstrel shows, which were a very popular form of entertainment at the time. Um, the process, by 1910 or so, this process of developing these Jim Crow laws was basically finished, and the North and the federal government don't really do anything to prevent it. So essentially what the Jim Crow laws did was they legalized segregation and they restricted the, right, the civil rights of African Americans in the South. Um, and in fact, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, actually begins to issue decisions that invalidate the civil rights that had been won by African Americans during Reconstruction and then uphold the segregation that is developing throughout the South. And the most famous of these decisions was, of course, the ruling in the 1896 case of Plessy versus Ferguson. This case involved a challenge to separate rail cars for black passengers. Uh, and they, this, these uh, African-American plaintiffs argued that seg this segregation of these railroad cars violated the 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection under the law. The Supreme Court disagrees. In a nearly unanimous decision, the court upholds the law, and it argues that these segregated facilities did not discriminate as long as they are separate but equal. So this is where that phrase separate but equal uh, comes into parlance here. Now, even with the end of Reconstruction, black political participation in the South does not come to a screeching halt. Uh, there are even a few African Americans who serve in Congress in the 1880s and 1890s, but political opportunities become much, much more restricted during this period. Um, black Southerners continue to cast their ballots throughout the South in the 1890s. In some states, they even posed some serious challenges to the dominant Democratic Party. Uh, and so what we see in, in the 1890s is a real effort to try to disenfranchise African Americans and poor whites as well. Uh, the ruling Democrats strike back and they enact laws in every southern state that are meant to eliminate the African American vote. Now these laws on paper appear to be colorblind, but actually they are designed to end black voting. Uh, and the most popular devices were things like the poll tax, uh, literacy tests. Sometimes you would be faced with a requirement that you had to demonstrate a, an understanding of the state constitution to the satisfaction of the voter uh, registration officials. Uh, and things like the Grandfather Clause, which basically said that if your uh, ancestor had not voted uh, prior to, um, I think it's, you know, 18, usually it's 1865 uh, or so, uh, then you also were not allowed to vote, which of course basically disenfranchises all African Americans. Uh, many of these laws also disenfranchise poor and illiterate whites. Uh, and this leads to Southern politicians really being able to mobilize white voters by extreme appeals to racism during this period. There are a lot of these demagogues that spring up and they make these, you know, sort of very uh, racist uh, politics. This could have not, of course, have been accomplished. This disenfranchisement could not have been accomplished without the acquiescence of the North and the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and as a result, what we see is that Southern congressmen 
wield this enormous amount of power and influence on the national stage, far more than their tiny electorates may have warranted. They were being elected on, a, you know, in some cases, a very small minority of the population, only the white you know, sort of population of a region, uh, in of many regions in the South were able to vote. And that population in some regions was a tiny minority. Uh, but they were, you know, sort of these Southern politicians were getting enormous amounts of influence as a result. Segregation and Jim Crow was really one part of this all-encompassing system of white domination and white supremacy in which each component you had disenfranchisement you had the unequal economic status of african americans you had african americans receiving inferior education you had racial separation in public facilities all of these serve to reinforce the others uh, and it really creates this system of what you know many people have have labeled as kind of an american apartheid system So how do African Americans respond to these conditions in the so-called New South? Uh, well, they respond in a variety of ways. Uh, so in the Upper South uh, and in cities, there are some economic opportunities. Uh, there was some economic development that happened in the Upper South, things like mines, uh, ironworks, uh, tobacco factories. Very often they would employ black laborers, as you can see in this photo here. Uh, this is a, you know, sort of a mining, uh, workers in, in a mine, and you can see that blacks and whites are working alongside each other here. Uh, also, another example along the coast of South Carolina and Georgia, where the main crop being grown was rice, uh, most of the plantations here had kind of fallen into pieces, and many African Americans are able to acquire land, and they're able to become self-sufficient farmers uh, in these regions. But in most of the Deep South, uh, African Americans end up, you know, sort of owning a smaller percentage of land in 1900 than they had at the end of Reconstruction. So land is actually taken away, or, you know, it falls out of their hands. In the cities, uh, there were a whole network of, of institutions that African Americans had created after the Civil War. Schools and colleges, churches, businesses, clubs. These all serve as the foundation for increasingly diverse black urban communities. Uh, and they support the growth of a black middle class. Mostly professionals, teachers, doctors, ministers, businessmen who were serving the needs of black customers. But the labor market is rigidly divided along racial lines. Black men are mostly excluded from supervisory positions. So if you worked in a factory, uh, you would not be allowed to advance, you know, sort of up the corporate ladder. Uh, white collar jobs definitely, you know, sort of most were excluded from. More black women worked for wages than white women at this time, but they were working mainly as domestic servants. Uh, and most unions excluded blacks as well, so that was another barrier to economic advancement for African Americans. Some African Americans uh, seek a way out by leaving the South. Uh, in 1879 and 1880, between 40 and 60,000 African Americans end up migrating to Kansas. Uh, and this was known as the Kansas Exodus, and it's led by a former fugitive slave named Benjamin Pap Singleton. Um, and you can see a picture of him here standing in front of a riverboat, which has some of his, you know, sort of migrants here behind him. Uh, he organized a real estate company, and he promotes the idea of leaving for Kansas, and it's depicted as this, you know, sort of land of opportunity and plenty. Uh, Unfortunately, most black migrants who go to Kansas, they don't have the money to really take up farming. And they, most of them ended up as, you know, working as unskilled laborers. Uh, but, a few, but very few of them chose to actually go back to the South. One minister said, uh, we had rather suffer and be free. So they were happy to just, you know, sort of escape the violence and degradation and discrimination of the South. Most African Americans, though, didn't have much of an alternative uh, but to stay in the South. Most of the job opportunities during this era were in the North, but most Northern employers refused to hire African Americans, so there really wasn't a lot of leeway or wasn't a lot of uh, places where they could go. Now, as we discussed, we have this system of white 
domination and racial segregation that develops in the South after Reconstruction. And every part of this system reinforces the others. And it's designed to ensure that when blacks and whites come into contact with each other, as of course they inevitably would in a society, whites would always have the upper hand. And regulating gender relations was a huge component of this. Uh, there are kind of two opposing stereotypes uh, that developed and kind of dominate thinking about gender and race during this period in the South. There's the ideal of the pure white Southern woman uh, and the flip side of that, the rapacious, violent African-American man. Now, as I said, these are stereotypes. They do not necessarily reflect reality. Uh, Black men, so the common belief ran, were all rapists who would attack and violate white women if they could. And these white Southern women are painted as pure, innocent victims who need the protection and the vengeance of white men. And so this, this is a whole kind of, you know, ideology, a way of thinking that is born out of this complex stew of racist and gendered attitudes uh, floating throughout society at the time. And this has tragic, real-world consequences for African Americans. Many white Southerners bought into this idea that they had to preserve the purity of white women. And this justified violent retribution against African American men for alleged crimes against white women. And this results in thousands of lynchings. Uh, lynching is basically murder by an angry mob uh, in the South in the late 19th and early 20th century. You can see this table here shows the number of lynchings in, in various Southern states, uh, states with over 200 lynchings between 1889 and, and 1918. And these are just the ones that we, you know, the documented cases, the ones we know about. Uh, so there's this huge problem of lynching in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, but one woman cho chose to stand up and challenge not just this practice of lynching and the racism that spawns the lynch mobs, but also the prevailing notions about gender and the proper role for women in society. And this was, of course, Ida B. Wells. Uh, she was born as a slave in Holly Springs, Mississippi in 1862. Uh, and during Reconstruction, she was educated at a freedman's school, and then she goes to college. And uh, her parents end up passing away in a, in a yellow fever epidemic when she was 14. And so she, she drops out of college, and to support her family, she begins teaching school. Um, she eventually moves to Memphis to live with her aunt and to help raise her younger sisters. And it's really here where she begins to challenge those societal norms. Uh, in 1884, she was asked by a conductor to give up her seat on a train to a white man uh, and to go into the, uh, the so-called Jim Crow car, which was also the smoking car. Um, and that car was already crowded with other passengers. There wasn't a seat. And so she refuses to move. Um, and she is forcefully taken off the train. When she goes back to Memphis, eventually gets back to Memphis, and she immediately hires an attorney to sue the railroad. Um, and she wins her case in the local circuit courts, but the railroad company appeals to the Supreme Court of Tennessee, and it reverses the lower court's ruling. Uh, so she ends up not winning her case, ultimately, but it was really just the beginning for her. She begins writing as a journalist, and in 1889, she becomes the editor of a popular African-American newspaper in Memphis. Uh, several years later, in 1892, three of her friends, who were prominent African-American businessmen, were brutally murdered by a lynch mob. Uh, and she, goes, uh, she sets out to investigate their deaths. And she writes this series of scathing editorials. Um, and this, of course, makes her a, a pretty prime target. Uh, so a mob ends up destroying her newspaper office, and she's forced to move to Chicago. Uh, and she continues this crusade against lynching uh, there, and she takes it kind of on a national scale. Wells really argued that the stated justification for many lynchings, the rape or sexual assault of a, of a white woman, was basically a lie. Uh, she exposes the fact that there are these interracial relationships going on in the South, that many of these alleged rapes were actually consensual, um, and that the real reason for many lynchings was in fact economic, 
uh, in nature. African Americans who are running successful business me- businesses who are in competition with whites are often become the targets of lynch mobs. Uh, and so she's really able to expose this. So Ida B. Wells becomes kind of a very influential African American leader in her community. Uh, the most influential African American leader during this time is Booker T. Washington. And he had also been born a slave. Uh, After the Civil War, he had gone to college. He'd studied at the Hampton Institute, which was a college for ex-slaves that was created during the Reconstruction era. And he was very deeply influenced by the college's founder, a guy named General Samuel Armstrong. And Armstrong argued that it was more important to get land and or to learn a trade or to become a skilled, you know, sort of laborer than to work for your rights of citizenship. So it's more important for African Americans who are coming out of slavery to establish themselves economically uh, rather than to, you know, immediately push for equality under the law. And Washington really puts this view into practice. He founds the Tuskegee Institute uh, in Alabama, which becomes a center for vocational education for African Americans. Uh, And in 1895, he gives a very famous speech in Atlanta in which he urges African Americans not to combat segregation. Uh, Instead, he argues that they should work on becoming economically self-sufficient. They should try to advance into the middle class. So we should try to grow the African American middle class. Um, And his message is really appealing to a lot of people. Uh, They are looking at the world that they're living in in the late 19th century, and they see that this system of white supremacy is basically all-encompassing. Uh, They don't really see how kind of attacking this system head on is going to get them anywhere. Um, And so they came to argue, and Washington comes to argue, and a lot of people sort of buy into this argument that African Americans should instead concentrate on building up their economic base and their segregated community. So they should work within the system of, you know, white supremacy and segregation and try to advance themselves as much as they can. Others disagreed with this approach, Um, and the most prominent opposition to Washington's ideas came from W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, He was a scholar and an activist. He was born in 1868 in Massachusetts, and he was very highly educated. He was the first African American to earn a doctorate from Harvard University. Um, And he spent his entire long career, uh, he actually lived to be 95 years old, so he lived well into the 20th century. Um, And he was basically devoted to thinking and writing about the black condition in America and the challenge it posed to American democracy. Du Bois very publicly disagreed with Washington's approach. He called the Atlanta speech the Atlanta Compromise. Uh, and he basically said that, you know, sort of this was a kind of a cowardly approach. He, he believed that educated African Americans like himself, uh, he called them the talented tenth of the black community, that they should use their education and their training to challenge inequality and to kind of tackle white supremacy head on. And he does more than just talk. In 1905, he gathers a group of black leaders at Niagara Falls. Uh, They had to meet on the Canadian side of the falls because no American hotel would actually provide them accommodations at the time. Uh, They organized the so-called Niagara Movement, which was really an attempt to try to reinvigorate the abolitionist tradition of activism and pushing for equality. And Du Bois writes in the group manifesto, we claim for ourselves the every single right that belongs to a free-born American. So there's this really this debate that sort of comes to uh, develop between accommodation versus agitation. And this is going to play itself out again and again throughout the 20th century in the civil rights movement. And in many ways, it still resonates uh, today, whether you should, you know, sort of work within the system or work to challenge the system, whether you should try to, you know, sort of advance things and be militant or whether you should try to, you know, sort of accommodate and try to, you know, advance in a different way. Uh, So these are things we're going to see kind of, you know, coming back uh, into play. Now let's turn our attention to the West. And... When we're talking about the West, first off, we really want to try to make sure to get our geography straight. 
Uh, and the first important thing to figure out is, you know, sort of why did people settle where they did in the West? Uh, and so we have to consider factors like topography, the terrain of an area of land, altitude, the elevation of land, what kind of crops grow in what environment, uh, climate, how hot or how cold it is, how much rainfall. So this is a physiographic map of the United States, which is just a fancy way of saying that it shows the different topographical regions and it gives an indication of what kind of climate we're looking at. Now, the important thing to notice here is this line that is running down the middle of the country. This is a rainfall line, and it represents an important divide. West of this line, everything west of this line, the average rainfall, the average rainfall per year is drastically less than what the lands east of this line experience. And so up to about 1840, White settlement had progressed to the edge of the Missouri timber country, which is right about here. The eastern part of the plains, uh, the you know parts of Wisconsin, Minnesota, some parts of the Dakotas, Nebraska and Kansas, Oklahoma and Texas, the soil here was good. They had good amounts of rainfall, but beyond this area, things get a lot drier, and. Basically, this whole region, most of North and South Dakota, uh, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, this is a semi-arid region of the country. There is not a lot of rainfall here. And then you have the Rocky Mountains, uh, which you know is a very formidable barrier to cross. Uh, coming down out of the mountains, you enter this western plateau area, which, if you've ever driven through it, is a fairly desolate region. Uh, it's you know basically nothing there. Um, and then after crossing the coastal mountain ranges, the Sierra Nevadas, the Cascades, then you get to the temperate lands on the Pacific coast. And these are, you know, sort of areas that are, you know, sort of also good for farming and, um, and agriculture. Early explorers of the West, they thought that the region, the land beyond the Mississippi is basically uninhabitable. Uh, indeed, early maps actually labeled this region the Great American Desert. Uh, so most early settlers, what we see is that most early settlers in the early part of the 19th century, the 1840s, 1850s, most of them head straight for Oregon and California. They go all the way across the United States and get to the coast. Um, and the middle part of the country is a pretty harsh climate. There's not enough rainfall to support extensive agriculture. There are very few trees uh, for lumber or to shield you from the winds. Uh, the soil is pretty tough. Uh, there's a lot of wildlife living here, including 15 million buffalo. It's not a very hospitable place to settle. But as we'll see in the late part of the 19th century, Americans do begin to settle and fill up this area. So between 1870 and 1900, 430 million acres in the West are settled mostly by white Americans. Uh, there are also some African Americans, uh, as we've talked about, uh, some Hispanics, uh, also some Asians coming in. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons for moving west. Uh, many came seeking adventure. They wanted to escape factory or city life. Uh, some came west for health reasons. Uh, some came uh, for because they were being persecuted for their religion. Um, most people came uh, for economic reasons. Uh, many, most people moved west to really try to better their lives. And as the nation's population grows, so does the demand for the products of the west, livestock, agricultural products, the mineral products, the lumber products. Uh, so this is this region that is, you know, sort of very booming uh, during this era. And We'll talk about this a little bit later uh, today, but it's important to realize that contrary to older historical views, the West was not really a so-called safety valve, an outlet for the social and economic tensions of the cities in the East. The poor and the unemployed who were living in urban areas in the eastern, in the, on the East Coast, they really couldn't afford to move west and they established farms. Uh, and most people moved west during times of economic prosperity, not times of economic hardship. So most of the people who were moving here were 
decidedly middle class. Uh, they had enough money to be able to equip themselves to, to farm and to live in these regions. Uh, the first movement of the West aimed for, as I said, California and Oregon. Uh, this started with the gold rush in 1849. And in the next 30 years, approximately 500,000 people made the journey uh, west over the Overland Trail. And this is, of course, what we think of when we think of the pioneers. We think of these can caravans of wagons inching across the plains. Uh, this kind of migration was usually a family affair. Uh, you would set out from Missouri in the spring. You would travel through the summer, uh, hoping to reach your destination before uh, the first snowfall fell. Um, and it was a rough journey. You had to, you know, work, everybody had to work to make the journey. Uh, and you would often have to walk about 15 miles a day. The trip was very exhausting. Uh, under the best of conditions, the trip overland took six months. Uh, and this meant traveling 16 hours a day. Now, as the railroads pushed west, especially after the, the creation of the Transcontinental Railroad, you start to see locomotives replacing those wagon trains. Uh, often you would, you know, travel part of the way on train, and then you would go the rest of the way to your final destination uh, via a wagon. Uh, and traffic in the West was not just from the East to the West. It flowed in all directions. Uh, so many do come from the East Coast uh, to the West, but you have others, uh, people coming from Mexico, moving up to the North. You have Asian Americans moving eastward from the Pacific Coast. And so the West becomes this sort of meeting ground or a borderland uh, of cultures uh, that really forms what we know as the modern West. Most people come west in the late 19th century because they have been promised or they have they are looking to obtain land from the US government. And so the gov the federal government plays an enormous role in the development of the west. Uh, the federal government owned about 1 billion acres of land in the 1860s and most of this land was unsuitable for agriculture. Uh, by about 1900, about half of this had been distributed. Uh, and between 1862 and 1890, the government gave away 48 million acres of land under the Homestead Act. Uh, 100 million acres were also sold to private individuals and corporations, and 128 million acres were actually granted to the railroad companies. And then there are huge tracts of land that are sold to the states as well. So Congress offers a variety of incentives to develop and settle in the West. Uh, the most famous, of course, was the Homestead Act in 1862. Uh, this famously gives 160 acres of land to anyone who was able to pay a small fee and agree to live on it and cultivate it for five years. And this sets off a mass migration. Between 1862 and 1900, nearly 600,000 families claim free homesteads. Uh, but the Homestead Act did not work as well as it might have been intended. Uh, very few of these farmers and laborers could afford to set up a farm. Uh, and that 160 acres was actually the wrong size for a lot of this region. Uh, it didn't really work very well in this region that was very, very dry. You needed to have either very much bigger farms or much smaller uh, holdings of land. And so it didn't work as well as it might have been intended. Uh, you also have a number of other acts uh, designed to, uh, passed by the federal government, designed to promote uh, Western development. You have things like uh, the Timber Culture Act of 1873. Uh, this offered more land to settlers who would plant trees on their land. Uh, the Desert Land Act of 1877 was an act that was lobbied for by cattle ranchers, and it allowed people to buy large areas of land very cheaply uh, if they would irrigate part of their land for within three years. Uh, the Timber and Stone Act of 1878 uh, permitted anyone in California and Nevada and Oregon and Washington to buy up forest land very cheaply. And so you see a lot of lumber companies taking advantage of this act, um, and they claim about three and a half million acres of land. Now, of course, all of this settlement fails to take into account that large numbers of people are already living in this area. 
1865, there were approximately 250,000 Native Americans living in the Western U.S. Some of these were tribes from the East who had been forcibly relocated uh, to what was known as Indian Territory, which is present-day Oklahoma. Uh, other tribes were Native uh, to the region. They were the Southwestern tribes like the Hopi and the Pueblo, uh, the Apache and the Navajo. There were tribes in California and the Pacific Northwest. And, of course, the tribes of the Great Plains, the Sioux, the Blackfoot, the Cheyenne. In the mid-19th century, nearly two-thirds of Native Americans lived on the Great Plains. Uh, and these Plains Indians were nomadic. Uh, they hunted buffalo. Uh, they were very skilled horsemen. The horse, of course, had been brought to North America by Spanish explorers in the 1500s, and it had spread north from Mexico onto the Plains. And it really changed the, the way of life of the Plains Indians there. Uh, the tribes gave up farming entirely, and they began to hunt the buffalo. And they became very nomadic. Uh, they developed a whole warrior culture, um, and they became very, very skilled uh, warriors and horsemen. Uh, most of these bands were migratory in culture. Uh, they lived in small, they were small groups of about three to 500 uh, each, and uh, they followed and they lived off the buffalo. The buffalo provided nearly everything that they needed to survive. Uh, wars between these Native American tribes were were limited. They were frequent, but they were limited. Uh, they, the tribes spoke different languages, but they would communicate with each other using sign language. And uh, there was this kind of loose organization of Native American tribes uh, that really, you know, confounded the federal government when they came to try to deal with these Native American tribes. Uh, by the 1880s, all of this had changed forever. Uh, by this time, by, especially by the 1890s, most Indians were living on reservations. Uh, many had been killed in warfare or decimated by disease. And so these once thriving and diverse and vibrant Indian cultures were crumbling uh, by the end of the century. And a lot of this had to do with the decimation of the buffalo, the environmental impact of white western settlement on, uh, on the land in the west, and especially uh, the, the animals that lived in the west, as particularly the buffalo, was just catastrophic. Uh, in 1800, there were an estimated 30, 30 million uh, buffalo roaming the Great Plains. By the turn of the 20th century, there were less than a thousand of them left. Uh, and as I mentioned, the Plains Indians had developed an entire way of life centered on this animal. They used every single part. They used it for food, for shelter, for clothing. They made weapons. Uh, there were maybe something like 50 different uses for different parts of the buffalo. They even boiled buffalo hooves to make glue. Uh, so it was their most important natural resource, and it was revered. Uh, Native Americans had a fundamentally different way of looking at the natural world. Uh, they were, of course, immersed in it. They were constantly witnessing the enormity of nature and the power of nature, and the buffalo were a part of that. And the Plains Indians who hunted them, they recognized they needed the buffalo to survive. Uh, and they, on they believed that they should honor the spirit of this animal by only killing as many as they needed to live and by using every part. What we see in the late 19th century is that rapid expansion of white settlements into the West causes catastrophic results for the buffalo. Uh, it is almost extinct by the end of the 19th century. And a lot of this had to do with the railroad. Um, some of it had to do with the rise of cattle farming uh, and mining industries, the spread of farms across the landscape, the creation of white settlements and towns and then cities. Uh, all of these represented the major causes for the destruction of the buffalo. And these didn't happen all at once, uh, but in kind of this overlapping pattern and movement, American expansion in the West changes the balance of nature permanently. It changes the environment. You have these railroad tracks, permanent features dividing up the landscape. You have depletion of trees for railroad ties and bridges. Uh, you have, you know, sort of hunting decreases the wild game. Uh, and Indians and whites really saw the buffalo from different points of view. As we said, the, the Plains Indians, they had learned to hunt the buffalo very skillfully using the bows and arrows. White professional hunters were brought in to supply meat 
to railroad crews, and they used rifles to shoot the buffalo. Uh, while the Na Native Americans were dependent on the buffalo, a white American culture stresses the cultivation of the land. Uh, there's less importance placed on these, you know, sort of animals. They're just getting in the way of our farming. And so as a result, the buffalo becomes hunted for sport uh, by white professional hunters and sportsmen. And you can see that depicted here uh, in this lithograph. Uh, it's a, you know, basically a uh, drawing of these white sportsmen hunting the buffalo uh, on a railroad train. Uh, and for the Plains Indians, the loss of the buffalo affected their whole scheme of life. Uh, the, uh, their, basically their whole understanding of their universe. Uh, and they saw that their life was being taken away from them. And so they began to realize that they were going to have to do something to fight for their lands. They were going to have to fight for the buffalo. So when we start to see violence and warfare breaking out on the plains in the late 19th century, this is really Native Americans just defending their lands and defending their way of life uh, and defending the environment. So in the years after the Civil War, the nation debates what to do about Native Americans. Uh, there are a series of violence that breaks out, wars and massacres perpetrated by both sides. Uh, this really sparks this debate on what to do about the so-called Indian question. Uh, and you have some people arguing, well, we want to, uh, you know, we want to help them get an education. We want to, quote unquote, civilize these tribes. Others questioned this approach. They were convinced that Native Americans could not be civilized. Uh, and there was a lot of fear on both sides. Uh, fears of Indian attacks uh, fed upon rumors. Uh, and there's a lot of fear and misunderstanding. Uh, in general, uh, you start to see, you know, sort of this policy of assimilation kind of start to win out. Uh, so in 1867, Congress creates uh, the Peace Commission. Uh, and it develops a policy of creating small reservations, which were designed to isolate Native Americans to try to teach them to farm and gradually, quote unquote, civilize them. Now, as you might imagine, this small reservation policy does not work very well. Uh, the reservation system basically fundamentally altered Native American customs. It chained them in poverty and isolation. And young Native Americans in particular, they did not want to abide. They did not want to stay on the reservation. They did not want to abide by these treaties. So they end up kind of, you know, reverting back to the old ways. Uh, and warfare breaks out again uh, in, the eight, in the late 1860s and early 1870s. And it really takes a, you know, good couple of decades to, uh, to end this violence. This policy of assimilation, some reformers, they, had, they were arguing, well, we, this policy of reservations is not working. Uh, and they argued, well, we should try to assimilate Native Americans into white culture and white society. Uh, they wanted to use education and land policy and federal laws to eradicate tribal society. And Congress begins to adopt this policy in 1871 when it ends the practice of tr making treaties with Native American tribes. So these tribes are no longer to be treated as separate nations. Uh, and this ends up having the, the consequence that these tribes end up losing a lot of their political and judicial power. Uh, the power of tribal chiefs is weakened uh, because of this. You also see educators uh, getting in to this, uh, to this question here. Uh, they are wanting to train young Native Americans to adjust to white culture. So in 1879, uh, 50 Plains Indian youth are brought to the Carlisle School in Pennsylvania. Uh, and at this school, they were taught practical skills. They forced these young Native American uh, boys to cut their hair, to wear civilized clothes. They made them speak English. They forbade them to practice uh, tribal ceremonies or to, you know, practice their, their tribal dances. The motto of these educators was, kill the Indian and save the man. Uh, and you can see that reflected in these two photographs here. This photograph here of uh, some young Native American boys who are brought to the Carlisle School. And then this is kind of the before and after picture uh, of what they looked like after they had been so-called civilized. 
Now, land ownership was the final link in this new policy. It was thought that land ownership would make Native Americans into responsible and self-reliant citizens. And so in 1887, Congress passes the Dawes Act. Uh, this act aimed to end tribal life. It basically took the tribe's lands and distributed those lands into small plots uh, for members. So it destroyed the communal ownership of Indian land. Uh, each family was to receive 160 acres, just like with the Homestead Act. Uh, and Indians who gave up their tribal lives were made U.S. citizens under this act. Uh, 47 million acres of land were distributed under the Dawes Act to Native Americans and families. Uh, another 90 million were set aside uh, in reservations. And these lands, often the most fertile lands, uh, were ed eventually ended up being sold to white settlers. Uh, so in the half century after the Dawes Act was passed, Native Americans lost about 86 million acres of land. And uh, overall, according to one estimate, if we look at kind of the broad sweep of American history between 1776 and today, it's estimated that the United States has acquired over one and a half billion acres of land from Native Americans uh, and acquired that land in a variety of ways, either uh, via treaties, by executive orders, court decisions, or outright theft. Now, with all of these violent changes to their way of life, some Native Americans sought solace in the ghost dance, which was a religious revival that swept through the Plains tribes in the late 1880s. And the leaders of this revival uh, told, uh, told their followers about a day when the white man would disappear from the landscape, uh, the buffalo would come back, and that Indians could reclaim their ancestral lands and their ancestral customs. Uh, and large numbers of Indians began to follow this, uh, this ghost dance practice. They gathered together for singing and dancing and religious ceremonies. And the ghost dance uh, was very frightening for white settlers and for government officials at the time. They were afraid that Native Americans were planning some kind of uprising. Uh, now, in reality, the Native Americans, they are Things, they're almost broken at this point. They are just trying to cling to the last vestiges of their way of life and recapture some of what they had lost, but white Americans did not understand that. And so on December 29th, uh, 1890, a group of soldiers opened fire on a gathering of Native Americans who were encamped near Wounded Knee Creek in South Dakota, and they ended up killing between 150 and 200 Indians, mostly women and children. The massacre was widely applauded in the press at the time, uh, and the army looked into uh, this action by these soldiers, and they essentially, they essentially exonerated the troops and their commander, and 20 of the soldiers were later awarded the Medal of Honor for their actions at Wounded Knee. And the Wounded Knee Massacre is significant because it marks the end of four centuries of armed conflict between Native Americans and European settlers and their descendants. By 1900, there are only about 250,000 Native Americans living in the entire United States. And in 1492, it's estimated that there had been more than 5 million. Most of these Native Americans are living on reservations. Many are extremely poor. Uh, alcoholism and unemployment were rampant. And probably most significant, uh, many of these tribes had lost a lot of their culture. Uh, they, they tried to cling on to it, but it was very difficult to kind of maintain uh, their culture uh, and their cultural distinctiveness, given this kind of overwhelming uh, you know, these, these overwhelming forces against them. Now, as Native Americans are losing their lives and they're losing their cultural identity, they begin to enter into the romantic folklore, the mythology of the West. And you start to see in the late 19th century this mythology developing. Dime novels describe, you know, these lurid tales of Indian fighting on the plains. 
Uh, Buffalo Bill Cody turns the mythology of the Plains Indian into a business. Uh, his Wild West show, which began in 1883 and which ran for more than 30 years, brings Western mythology to millions of people around the world. And Native Americans, as you can see here, played a very prominent role uh, in the show. Uh, they chased Indi they chased buffalo, they performed a war dance, uh, they attacked a settler's cabin in the show. Uh, in 1885, Sitting Bull, uh, who had vanquished Custer at the Battle of Little Bighorn, joins Cody's troupe as a performer. And you can see that, you know, sort of images of the images of, Amer of Native American life that are being portrayed here uh, and, you know, sort of the kind of stereotypical sort of image, imagery that's being, you know, kind of popularized uh, under this, you know, kind of mythology of the West. So between the Civil War and 1900, we see the West really sees one of the greatest migrations in history. Uh, and obviously this enormous change is noticed by the people at the time. And Americans are reacting to what's happening in the West in different ways. In 1890, the census noted that for the first time in the nation's history, there is no longer a frontier. And by frontier, they mean, you know, sort of an area of land beyond which there is not a huge amount of settlement, beyond which there aren't a lot of, you know, cities or towns or even, you know, kind of small farms. Uh, there is no longer a frontier. And this announcement catches the attention of a young historian named Frederick Jackson Turner. And three years later, he delivers an address at a, uh, at a historian's conference uh, entitled The Significance of the Frontier in American History. And in this address, he defines the frontier as the empty land on a margin of a settled area having a population of, more than two, of two or more persons per square mile. So according to Turner... Life on the frontier evokes certain character traits among people. Uh, strength, acuteness, inquisitiveness, practicality, uh, you know, a energy, a restless energy, and above all, kind of this dominant, exuberant individualism. He argues that the person who enters the forest, who, enter, who goes past the edge of the frontier, that that person is a European, and the person who comes back the person who comes back from the frontier is an American. So the frontier, according to Turner, makes America what it is. For the nation as a whole, this process is repeated for nearly 300 years, and this has important results, according to Turner. Uh, and the frontier, he argued, made the United States more self-sufficient. Uh, it made, you know, the frontier, it gave the, you know, frontier, it gave Americans their sense of nationalism. So Turner's 1893 address is this classic idea of the frontier thesis, but eventually he publishes 13 separate pieces in which he elaborates and expands on uh, his idea of the frontier. Uh, and he never kind of is very consistent about his use of the frontier. Uh, he often kind of confuses it with physical mobility. Uh, and he argues that one of the most kind of discussed aspects of the Turner thesis, the idea that it was a safety valve, the idea that the frontier uh, was a safety valve, that the economic hardship in the East drives people to the West. Uh, this is something that is developed, you know, sort of a bit later. He develops this idea a bit later. And uh, historians have looked at this idea and they have seen that, you know, he was actually totally wrong about that. Uh, as I mentioned before, it wasn't that economic hardship was driving Western settlement. Um, the frontier thesis, to a certain extent, it's kind of it's an interesting idea um, in that it you know sort of is the idea that you know sort of what makes America American, what makes it what it is. Uh, and Turner argued, well, it's the frontier that does it. It's the frontier that, you know, sort of has has made America what it is today. Uh, and, you know, how, why is America different from Europe? Uh, this is, you know, kind of how to explain that. Um, and Turner's, you know, sort of answer uh, is is kind of a persuasive idea. 
that we had this frontier, uh, this society, you know, sort of has to be profoundly affected when its citizens year after year are leaving established communities and they begin a new and a strange environment. Uh, you know, sort of eat when you know, you can even dream of going to the West, even if you can never actually go. There's that dream out there. Uh, when, you know, sort of uh, expanding settlements, they demand the most extensive transportation network in the world. Uh, and so Western settlement really, you know, sort of causes America to develop in a way that is unique uh, to the rest of the world. Historians in recent years have looked at Turner's thesis and they have kind of debunked it mostly. Uh, and most uh, historians today, they do not see the American frontier experience as, you know, having created America or making America, you know, somehow kind of unique or different. Uh, they look at the West in a different way. Uh, they see the West as an arena of conflicting interests. Uh, they emphasize the region's racial and ethnic diversity. They stress the role of women in the West as well as men. They question the impact of the development of the West on the environment. Uh, and so the settlement of the West is now seen by most historians as more of a process of conquest. You see kind of Western settlement as a series of waves of cultural groups moving in many different directions, interacting with each other. And Western history doesn't stop in 1890. It continues on into the 20th century. Uh, so a lot of Western historians have started looking at the West as a separate region into the 20th century and focusing on, you know, sort of uh, focusing on uh, the way it develops and how it shapes, you know, kind of uh, the environment, how it shapes race and ethnicity and and all these kind of different aspects of the West. So it's a lot more complicated and nuanced a picture of the West than you might see from, you know, kind of the stereotypical mythology that has developed around the West, the kind of West that we see in depicted in Hollywood films. Uh, it's a way more complicated than that. And so that kind of wraps us up for today. I hope you guys have enjoyed it, and I will uh, be back to talk a little bit more with you next week.